Well, we're going to uh, open this uh, opportunity to listen to uh, Jonathan Irish and Stephanie. Uh, yeah, it's that one. Well, my name is Paul Ingbretson. I'm a representative from Haverhill, New Hampshire. And um, I've been the chairman of the Legislators Redress of Caucus, Redress of Grievance Caucus, that, um, that we've begun because of uh, a lack of redress, which is a guarantee of the Constitution in our, um, in our state. And um, we have been listening to various complaints against various officials in our state. And so when this opportunity came up to listen to the Irish case, um, we, t we decided to take advantage of it. And that's what we're here for today. We're trying to listen to not with with no assumptions about anybody, no assumptions about anything wrong doing on the part of DCYF at all. Nothing, no assumptions at all. We're just here to hear what Mr. Irish has to say. Oh. Well, that's the story. Uh, I'm sorry. There was one time where where Catherine had told her, "Well, trust me. If, if you leave Jonathan, then you'll get the kids back." She tried it for about 72 hours, and the same thing happened again. Um, at this point. We actually, I had had several conversations with Catherine Galton, asked, her, asked Catherine what her problem was with me, and she said, well, you were abused as a child by your biological, by your, by your dad. And I said, no, he's my biological father. I do not like him. I do not associate with him for those exact reasons. And she said, well, either way, regardless, you were abused by him when you were a kid, and he abused your mother. So that that automatically sets you up to be an abuser. So you have to be guilty of this. You have to have done this. And I say, where's your proof? I, I haven't done that thing that you're accusing me of. You know, if you're gonna accuse me of something, at least have some kind of evidence to back it up with. And she continues to say, I don't have to have evidence. It's my word against yours. Um, and this continues, this just keeps continuing on and on and on. Catherine Galt never provides any, any evidence Nobody provides any evidence to their allegations of what they're saying. Uh, and then we go to the review hearing where Steph, because I never attended the review hearings with Stephanie and my mother, because Catherine Galt made it very known that she did not like me. So, you know, I wasn't going to try and cause waves by going to these hearings, these meetings. Well, in one of the meetings, Catherine Galt, and this was back in when she first mentioned Oath Keepers. Back in January. When I, I had just started affiliating with them, and it was just on, on an internet message board, essentially. I wasn't a dues-paying member. It was just an affiliate. Um, somehow, someway, they had been keeping tabs on me. Uh, Catherine, Catherine had said the reason she found out about my involvement with those keepers is because she Googled my name, Jonathan Irish, and came up with my Facebook account. Well, again, Catherine Galt said she Googled my name, and I asked her what name. She said, John Irish. Or, I'm sorry, Jonathan Irish. She, she corrected herself, and I said, well, that's interesting, because my name's never been linked to any Facebook account under that name. I said, you can Google it. It'll, you know, it'll come up with, with a Jonathan Irish or two, but it's not me. Not me at all. And she started, stopped dead in her tracks, and I said, where'd you get this information? Because she had gotten information about a hunting rifle I had purchased and several other things. Um, and including my involvement with Oath Keepers, and she refused to tell me. She told me she does not have to give me this information. Um, well, we, we go back to the review hearing, and Catherine Med says it's a concern. Uh, Jonathan's involvement with this uh, militia known as the Oath Keepers is a concern. And my mother and Stephanie both stand up immediately and say, first of all, it's not a militia. It's an organization of individuals who swear to uphold and defend the Constitution. And my mother looks right at Catherine Galt and says, do you have a problem with people that defend the Constitution? And Catherine Galt, no joke, my mother would have been here today if she could have, but she's, she's watching our daughter, taking care of our daughter, because we both needed to be here today. Um, my mother stood up, or Catherine Galt stood up and looked at my mother and said, yes, I do have a problem with people like that. Sure. <coughs> Representative Almaldasaro. Yeah, um, I keep hearing about Second Amendment and other issues here. Do you have any felonies? No, I do not, sir. You haven't been involved with the police? I have when I was younger. Um, I haven't had any any issues except the false arrest that I'm going to trial on next month. 
and over two years. Okay, then my question is, here, because I hear all this here on this hearsay of their interpretation, the one against the laws, but are there any police reports, any type of DCYF reports, anything in writing on what they've done on appointments or decisions making, anything that we can view or see? Uh, um, we, have, we have all the documentation with us. Um, are you talking what they've said about uh, us owning firearms specifically? I'm saying, yeah, anything dealing with firearms because I mean, uh, maybe give it to us after instead of right now. I'd like to see this. Anything is documented on there because you have firearms justified you not to be a good father or a... Uh, Here, if anyone's interested, this is the dismissal of the restraining order Stephanie was forced to get in order for her to move into her parents. What I'm getting out of this, I'm open to all, I'm a little confused. What I'm getting out of it, the kids are taken away because of your involvement with John because he's an oak keeper. I mean, if that's the case, we all uh, probably lose our families because I, I should be an oak keeper myself. Um, but the bottom line, where is the documentation? That's what I'd like to see on versus PSA or could have, might have, should have. From someone sitting outside the box, if I guess you could say, um, yeah, I could understand, I could understand that point of view. But when, when you've been in this situation and you've seen from the outside, from the inside out, the fact that they have no evidence to back up anything. Matter of fact, in the family law, uh, Catherine Galt herself and Judge Susan Ashley looked directly at us and said, "Because I said, you know, where's your evidence? You know, if you're gonna, if you're gonna accuse me of doing something." I really hope you have something to back it up with. And they said, in the family court, there pretty much is no burden of proof. And I, I turned around and looked at it and said, really, so all, you, all it has to be is somebody who thinks they're almighty can have an opinion and base it on hearsay? And they said, yes. If any of these allegations they have made are have any weight to them at all or anywhere near true, there is no way in God's green earth they would have returned a newborn to us. I mean, that's, that's, I, in my opinion, that would just be common sense. I mean, it's not like they returned her saying, oh, well, we're going to stay in your lives, we're going to do home visits. No, it was dismissed, no strings attached, everything but an apology. And if any of these allegations are true, especially the supposed, the alleged domestic violence or the alleged abuse, if they had any evidence to back any of that up, they would have never returned a newborn to us. One thing, one thing, because when we had the hearing last Thursday, uh, when they returned our daughter and threw everything out, uh, both the attorney that was representing myself and Stephanie's attorney both looked at us and said, they returned a newborn, they returned an infant to you. They have no grounds to refuse to return the other two children to you. You wouldn't think so. Exactly. You know, it seems to me that there's a hierarchy of concerns in the general safety of children the first has to be the safety of the child. Correct. Really, in the, in the immediate circumstances, that's the Trump. We don't want children harm. Um, but where we seem to have a priority drawn is, is what should be the second priority. It seems to me, which is to maintain families, mm -hmm. to, to have children be with their biological parents. And yet, it seems to me, maybe you know, that's my question to you, it seems that the department has has missed that priority. So it seems to me, from what I've heard in this case and other ones, there's the um, DCYF seems to be assuming that children that they take into custody, into custody should be sent elsewhere um, and parental rights should be terminated. Um, and, 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 you know, state resources, DCYF resources should be directed to resurrecting families that are having difficulty and making them good places for their own children. If, yeah. And just, I just see something, you know, in your, your situation and others, I see something really wrong here where we seem to be taking a bunch of decisions made that 
take the child and, and make sure he's safe, then the, the presumption is he should never return the child. If I may, also, um, in their petition uh, for abuse and neglect, they state, Dana Bickford stated that the neglect, well, I forget if she worded it as abuse and neglect or just abuse, but alleged that that, that took place on 6 October 2010. Done, okay, it was just in that line. Well, the interesting thing is Cheyenne was born at 11.37 p.m. on October 6th. So in a matter of 23 <coughs> minutes, we have abused, we abused our daughter, or neglected our daughter. I would like to make a point of clarification on this, having studied the affidavit and the ex parte order and the law. The affidavit makes a number of uh, makes uh, seven allegations. The conclusion is that this is sufficient to justify neglect as defined under 169C colon 3-B Roman numeral 19. And neglect is defined as, uh, I have to paraphrase here, uh, failure to provide or um, inability to discharge one's duties as a parent due to physical or mental incapacity. <clears throat> Being as the child and parents were in the hospital at the time the child was taken, it would be my judgment that the first part of that, which is actual phys physical neglect, was a practical impossibility. Nothing in the affidavit provides any professional documentation that there is any inability to uh, discharge their duties as a parent. There's no uh, statement by a psychologist. There's no, uh, there's no statement by a physician that there's an inability to uh, physically discharge their duties as parents. The ex parte order states that it is supported by the affidavit. The ex parte order says that the child is in, in, in imminent, imminent danger, which is defined under uh, the same chapter and verse, except it's uh, Roman numeral 15, I believe, which means there's a, 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 an immediate risk of harm. There is nothing, since if the affidavit states that the issue is one of neglect, the affidavit does not support the ex parte order. And there's nothing in the in the affidavit that supports his claim of neglect. Okay, get a ride. Right. 